District 1, Barbara McQuinn. Here. District 2, Chuck Shaw. Here. District 3, Karen Braille. Here. District 4, Erica Whitfield. Here. District 5, Frank Barbieri. <coughs> Absent. District 6, Marcia An Andrews. Here. District 7, Deborah Robinson. Let the record show we have a quorum. We will do the pledge at the uh, special meeting. So we'll move on. Uh, we were, the schedule for this afternoon, for anyone who's watching, we were scheduled to have an AC client session and that has been postponed until June. So today's calendar has us doing uh, two workshops, two board discussion items, and then the special meeting. Um, so I'd like to remind everybody, district staff, and board members, this meeting is being transcribed in real time so it can be viewed with closed captioning. Please speak at a reasonable pace so that t the transcribers can fully capture what you are saying. Thank you very much. And um, we also, board, we need to designate somebody to be vice chair for this meeting. So, Mrs. Brill. I would, I would like to suggest that we designate um, Dr. Deborah Robinson. All right, we have a motion second. Any discussion, all in favor, all opposed? You didn't even have a chance to say no, so. <laughs> <laughs> so our first item on the agenda is a budget workshop. Mr. Burke, Mr. Oswald. All right, good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm joined here with Ms. Heather Knust, our budget director, and Leanne Evans, our treasurer. We are gonna do our best to speak at a reasonable pace. We usually like to talk really fast, <laughs> but we're gonna slow it down a little bit. Uh, I'd like to start out with just a brief kind of rundown on the legislative session, or just the legislation that really impacts your budget for next year. The board will be provided on June 5th a comprehensive workshop with the whole legislative team and Mr. Tierney where they'll, they'll uh, you know, go through everything that passed. We're just gonna touch on those things again that have like a financial impact. Uh, it was an exciting session. We saw a tug of war of our finances and the board's local control throughout the session and particularly the last few days. Uh, but there's some things we just wanna bring to your attention in case you haven't already seen it. Uh, some of this has played out in the news quite a bit. So I'll move pretty quick. But this year we had uh, Senate Bill 7070. Uh, that was this year's really train bill for education. You may recall the last couple of years we've had, we had House Bill 7055 and House Bill uh, 7069. Uh, those were over 200 pages in length and touched on a variety of topics. Uh, 7070 does the same thing, but it's, it's not quite as big. It was about 93 pages uh, and it's got a, you know, a few handfuls of topics. So within 7070, uh, we have the Family Empowerment Scholarship Program, or vouchers. This got a lot of press, but for the first time, uh, we're gonna see FEFP dollars, about $150 million from the FEFP going to private schools through these uh, scholarships. That they can serve up to 18,000 students across the state in this first year, which, and then it's allowed by statute to grow a quarter of a percent each year quarter percent of the total state population of students that is. So that's about 7,200 kids a year it could grow by uh, or about $60 million a year. So over time, this program c could potentially get uh, to be a pretty uh, large size. The 7070 also revamped the best and brightest uh, teacher and principal uh, scholarships or bonuses or, or awards. Uh, it eliminates the piece where uh, teachers were eligible for that $6,000 scholarship and part of the requirements were having the, their college board ACT or SAT test, uh, that's gone. Uh, but now what teachers are eligible for is uh, for highly effective that meet the requirements of $2,500 uh, scholarship or bonus. And then for effective teachers, it falls to $1,000. Uh, and then principals also have uh, some bonus provisions. And there's some new nuances on that. Uh, there can be uh, some one-time recruitment uh, scholarships. And uh, they've renamed these uh, scholarships a little bit. They're calling them retention awards, which is a little bit different. Uh, so we're waiting to get more uh, details on that from the state on how that'll be implemented. But that'll be in play for our teachers next year and principals. And then probably some of the best news uh, we received was in uh, the area of our capital budget through 7070. The board has now got some flexibility uh, granted back to them with the use of your 1.5 mills capital, local capital outlay improvement millage. 
uh, those monies when uh, used for new construction now, the board will no longer need to get approval from the state for an ed plant survey. And also it eliminates the cost, the student station construction caps on, on those projects as well, which will give us some flexibility that we need <laughs> to get this work done. Uh, we still though are constrained by just fiscal realities. And, uh, but again, it was, it was very positive. This, this helps us quite a bit with our capital plan and the 10 year capital plan. I think we've covered that. The, so moving ahead, one last piece about 7070. Uh, they've revamped the turnaround program. You may recall uh, traditional district operated schools did have a slice of the Schools of Hope grant. Uh, we had some schools qualify and those th Schools of Hope grants were providing $2,000 per student. We now have a categorical allocation that'll be part of the FEFP for turnaround schools that they call turnaround school supplemental services that provide uh, up to $500 per student for the schools that qualify. And then House Bill 7123, I know you guys have this down pat after uh, our efforts there, but uh, you know, at the end of the day, that's the tax package that provides the sales tax holiday and the hurricane preparedness holidays. And most importantly, uh, it allows us to retain our referendum that the voters approved back in November. It does require on a go forward basis that any referendums passed that is voted on and approved after July 1st, 2019, there are requirements that on those discretionary millage referendums that we, uh, the charter schools would be included and it specifies that charter schools would receive their proportionate share based on their enrollment or unweighted FTE. Uh, it requires that the charter schools would have to spend those dollars uh, you know, in the spirit of the ballot language, and I shouldn't say spirit, it should, the, do, the charter schools would have to use the dollars to carry out the intent of that referendum and that ballot language. Uh, so uh, that's something we'll have to think about in the future and how we work that in. And then we've got Senate Bill 7030, which is the, the safety bill, security bill, it kind of picks up where the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Safety Act left off. You may recall last year, a part of that legislation required that any new dollars we got in safe schools had to go for just solely hiring additional officers. Uh, we got a little flexibility there. Now as this safe schools categorical continues to grow that you can use the money for uh, any of those things that promote school safety. And you know, it, there's a menu of things that the dollars could go to. Our board, you know, and this has been the case for decades, we always spend above and beyond uh, what we get in safe schools dollars. So that's, that's really not an issue for us. And we also have the referendum, which is gonna help us out quite a bit in that area. And then uh, one thing just to keep on our radar, uh, we've been talking about the district cost differential for a couple of years. There was a push this year to, they had a consultant come in and do a new study that recommended that the state shift from uh, kind of the market basket consumer price index approach to the DCD to a wage-based index. And now the EDR, uh, the EDR, the state economic and demographic research uh, arm of the legislature has been tasked with developing that formula uh, by October of 2019 so that the legislature could consider revising the DCD formula based on a new index, a wage index for FY21. So we'll continue to monitor that. Uh, real quick, I'm gonna give you just a the little context on the budget in total. Uh, we've kept kind of our running tab here and you can see for the three prior years, uh, once we got to the final conference, got the final budget, you know, we always kind of boil in and say, boil down to, okay, how much more money are we getting on a per student basis? And for the past couple of years, it's ranged from 1% to 1.39%. Uh, this year's budget is a little bit better, uh, but you have to really kind of look at the fine print uh, if you look at just what's reported out of the t increase per student, it would appear it's as high as you know 3.27%. That's really not accurate because we have a shift this year with the best and brightest program where that had been funded outside the FEFP in prior years. It's been shifted in as a categorical into the FEFP this year. So as a result, you've got $284 million uh, showing up as a complete increase but really, you know, there's 233 million that were in Best and Brass last year, which is outside the FEFP. So by shifting it in for just one year, uh, it skews that year over year comparison. So what we've done is we've broken that out. It's over $100 per student is just best and brightest. So if you, if you back that out to get a better read on the true increase, it, it falls to 1.92%. 
within that 1.92%, we do have some categoricals that are restricted, including safe schools, mental health, and the turnaround program I just mentioned. Uh, if you back those out and say, okay, what do we really have in terms of kind of dollars that are flexible, it falls to uh, an adjusted increase of 1.62%. So again, that's a little better, you know, than where we were a year ago at 1.39. And uh, of that 1.39 last year, a lot of that was restricted to safe schools and mental health. Uh, but at 1.62%, it's still fairly modest uh, when we get to, when we start thinking about what we'd like to do in the way of employee salary increases. Uh, so that's kind of the highlight. I want to uh, turn it over to Ms. Knust, and she's going to take you through the operating budget and the work that your budget advisory committee has been doing to get us to a balanced budget. Mr. Shaw. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Can I just ask a quick question on the sure. on the first item where you talked about the family empowerment scholarship? Um, so my, it's my understanding that 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 amount of money and that amount of students that they're thinking about is statewide, right? Not just for us. Oh yes, eighteen thousand statewide. Okay, and then. Um, how many students do we anticipate here? Do we have any idea of what, what might be um, the amount the, uh, that comes in? So I usually, look, if I look at, you know, just to try to gauge it, our district in terms of enrollment represents about six and a half percent of the state. So if we did, you know, maybe rough estimate 16 and a half, or six and a half percent of 18,000, which would be what Ms. Canoose, is that 480 <laughs> kids? Or? chief financial <laughs> officer. Uh, <laughs> right now. Where's the calculator? I can usually do those, but now I'm nervous. Uh, <laughs> okay. I would never even but. try. So I guess the question I'm really asking is more about how much of, would it come out of our budget, do you think? And, and is it, there's not a separate allocation, I'm guessing. They're just saying that we would hand over so, that funding, right? Right, it's gonna be similar to, uh, we've had the McKay scholarships for years, which are for, exceptional student education, yeah. and uh, those dollars kind of just pass through us, so the money comes in and it goes right back out to the private provider. Uh, this will be handled in the same way. We're gonna have some responsibility to report those students to the state, uh, and then we'll basically hand the money right over. And would we end up only handing over the um, student allocation, or is there any other additional funds that go along and follow the student? Do we have to add additional funds to that? Uh, the statute spells it right out. It but says it, what it's, we have to give. Um, it's pretty much the, the money follows the child, everything that's generated through the FEFP. Okay. Okay. Oh. Thank you. And, um, okay, we did the math. 6.5% um, of 18,000 is 1,170 students, so probably roughly as many as 1,000 plus kids. kids. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, thank you. All right, so now that you have an overview of the statewide budget impact, we're gonna focus on Palm Beach County. So the FY20 budget, uh, general fund budget is $2.1 billion. The referendum comprises about 10% or a little over $200 million. Um, schools represent the largest component of our budget, as they should, and the FEFP is the largest revenue driver of the general fund budget. So now we're gonna look at the FEFP um, specifically for Palm Beach County. And I know there's a lot of numbers on this page, so I'm gonna try to just break it down to a, a few um, key um, numbers. We're gonna start with the unweighted FTE. That's the first row, uh, row one. You can see that our projected increase in enrollment is 746 um, students, and that's district-wide. Uh, the past couple years, we've been seeing that enrollment growth is starting to slow, and even in our neighboring districts, it's actually started to decline. Um, so next I wanna move down to the base student allocation. The increase in the base student allocation is $75. Once we take into consideration the district cost differential, which didn't change this year, um, all, the formula is still the same, and um, it's based on a three-year average, so this year's rate is very similar to last year. Our uh, base student allocation is $76.59. The base student allocation is, is where we really have the most flexibility in how we spend those funds. So next I wanna move down to the categoricals. And the categoricals is where the state earmarks, they mandate specifically how we can spend those funds. There was a slight increase in safe schools and the mental health allocation of about $1.5 million. But there was a significant de decrease in the digital classroom allocation. It's almost eliminated. It went from 2.9 million to a little less than 400,000. And that's, keep in mind, district-wide, including charter schools. And then what Mr. Burke talked about, the best and brightest allocation, you can see that on row 19. That represents $19.8 million of the allocation. 
So the total increase in state funding is $24.5 million. So now we're gonna move on to the local funding. Um, the Palm Beach County tax roll is projected to increase by 5.6%, and that is in line with what the county property appraiser is predicting as well. And you would think, or you all know, that um, our funding does not increase at the same rate as the property taxes. So even though that increases 5.6%, the legislature continued to roll back the RLE as they have in the past few years, giving us only credit for the increase in new construction. So you can see that our increase in um, local funding is 28.9 million for a total increase in funding of $53 million. So if we were to break that funding down by a per student basis, it's $248, but that includes um, the best and brightest allocation. So if you back out that best and brightest allocation, it's over $100, brings down the per student funding to $144 per student or 1.85%. And then if you back out the increase in the categoricals that are earmarked for a specific purpose, we're down to $125 per student or 1.61%. We also have to take into consideration the increase in charter school um, enrollment. So district-wide, we're looking at 746. We're looking to pretty much um, split that enrollment increase with charter schools. So the increase to charter schools is, is uh, estimated at $8 million. So that leaves remaining uh, net district funding um, available for next year's budget of 45.3 million, which seems like a lot of money, but then we have to look at what has the state um, already earmarked and what are the legislative mandates. Uh, so the uh, legislature um, increased the FRS rate, the amount that we have to pay for FRS as a district, that's two and a half million dollars. Then we have to back out those categoricals because those are, are set aside for a specific purpose the best and bright, brightest being the largest at um, almost $20 million. It, I have a question. This is Brill. Thank you, and I just wanted to ask a quick question. I know this figure was in there, but what exactly um, did you say our funding per student is for now, or now and what is anticipated? The funding per student taking out the best and brightest is $144.96 per student, or 1.85%, and then backing out not only the best and brightest, but the increase in the categoricals. Yeah, but I'm talking about the, the total number. Okay. Oh, of what it's um, 7,992. 7,000? $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7, $7,
And then also in our departments, there was an elimination of a director position, as well as some non-salary, which totaled that $7 million. So there is a slight deficit of $2.1 uh, $2 million, but when you consider the size of our budget at $2.1 billion, we are pretty close to being balanced, you know, especially when we have some variables that are still outstanding. So now I'm going to move on to um, getting into more detail on our budget investments for FY20. We've spoken a lot in detail about the referendum and what's included within those referendum initiatives. So I'm gonna focus on um, the new initiatives within the schools and the department, departments. We've aligned those, uh, those um, uh, investments to the strategic plan and the strategic themes. Uh, so we have $3.4 million um, that's invested in effective and relevant instruction to meet the needs of all students. Um, $3 million of that is related to changes within the ELL allocation, as well as the increase of the non-salary of the fine arts allocation at elementary, middle, and high schools. And then we, we're also, we continue to see an increase in the amount we're spending on dual enrollment. There's also um, three um, positions that are being added within the departments. One is to help support the work with equity and access. And then there are two positions within curriculum to support curriculum and testing, not only with the FSA, but also AP, IB, and ACE, in, in addition to providing additional support to the testing coordinators. We added, um, that's where I'll move on to um, the next initiative, positive and supportive school culture of 1.9 million. The majority of that is related to the high school um, testing coordinators that were added. And the reason why it falls under this initiative is because the purpose of adding that position was to free up time at the counselor. Uh, we, the next is talent development. And within um, talent development, uh, we're adding a director uh, for non-instructional recruitment, as well as um, two positions to provide support and coaching to new teachers and also employees within the district. Um, under high performance culture, um, there's two um, Broad residents uh, that are being added um, for, uh, to assist with the alignment and implementation of performance um, measurement uh, metrics uh, within the district. Under the operational initiatives, it's approximately $900,000 and the majority of that is aligns with, is work around um, maintenance. We have over a thousand um, custodians um, district wide. Um, so we're adding a general man manager for custodians as well as a technician and also adding um, a purchasing uniforms for all custodians district wide. Uh, under, and then under the board direct reports, we have the inspector general's office, which is requesting to add a senior auditor position um, to audit the sales tax projects and then two attorneys within the general counsel's um, department um, to add uh, as a result of increased work due to the sales tax, as well as increased work to not only general liability, but um, charter school um, uh, litigation as well. And so the total of those investments is 7.2 million, offset by this, it's pretty much offset by the realignments and savings we've been able to realize. And all of these initiatives we walked through at the last budget uh, advisory committee in detail, and the slides are also included in your appendix as well. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and maybe it's in the slides and I didn't see it. Uh, can we get the uh, specifics, uh, for instance, for um, the additional uh, ELL and dual enrollment, can we get specifics as to what's involved in each one of those, i.e. Uh, talent development, I think you were talking about maybe a, a new director or something like that. Can we get that? Is that, I didn't see that in, in here. Yes, it? it's included in the appendix, but we can also provide it as well. Well, yeah, would you? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right, we'll look for it. I didn't see it. Mrs. McQuinn. My question has to do with, which is typically what I question, is adding people uh, positions to budgets, and I'm going to be specific with three here, but it's not to pick on those three. Um, <clears throat> when they, two of them specifically are asking for additional positions because and I'm, uh, the inspector general and the uh, general counsel it, to, let's put aside the charter school, but each of them have asked for one for additional monitoring 
or auditing of the referendum monies. And I need to be convinced that some things can't come off the table. It just, it, it concerns me when we are asking for money and then we start funding administrative positions for that money when we have court, we have our oversight committees. So that is just, it's, it's a, it's, for me, it's a red flag. The other one that I um, um, question, I don't know about the charter. I know that we've had so many issues with legal, with charter. I would just like to see in terms of legal and a charter position that we are then taking on more in-house since we're paying for an in-house position. The other is the talent development non-instructional director to understand why we need another director level position at this point. Thanks. Ms. Rico. Thank you, I'd be happy to respond to uh, the two items um, that, that we requested. So um, as the board may know, and as, as I know the budget office knows, we carefully go through our projections for the next year based on trend analysis from the past years. We monitor our um, legal hours put in, caseload um, claims, um, and the trends. And so we do that in all categories. With respect to the transactional work, it's actually not monitoring. It's, it's contracts, purchase orders, um, bid protests, bid re reviews, language negotiations, which has been um, highly uh, um, uh, challenging with the intensive work that's going on. And due to the fact that it's a capital plan that goes for 10 years, um, we expect that this work is not gonna be a one-off type of thing. Otherwise, we would have just gone to outside counsel. So we really do balance those. Um, and, and I do understand the sensitivities of adding a, a a person um, rather than outsourcing it for a, a temporary situation. As for the litigation piece, um, while charter schools is part of our litigation load that's um, seen an uptick, um, we actually have had a very intense uptick in our EEO and HR employment related litigation and those attorneys are really maxed out. Um, and when the attorneys get maxed out in terms of their caseload, um, we will have to go, we have to go to outside counsel. And so one example of that was last year where we did have to go to outside counsel for um, something other than the extraordinary. We have very few matters that we outsource. Um, the extraordinary ones was the House bill uh, constitutional challenge in the referendum lawsuit. But other than that, it's been mild, um, except for one part of a charter school litigation that went outside and the cost of that could have funded um, almost one of the attorneys we're asking for. So it's very expensive to go outside and it doesn't really take us. It's like using a taxi instead of buying the car. This is Whitfield. Thank you. I just wanted to ask about the the slide where you look at the budget o outlook. Um, this is just a question, but it looks like we are um, projecting a deficit there. And I just was curious, how do you, how does that align with, you know, we're setting up for a deficit. So wh where does that money come from in the end? Well, there are, oh. Sorry. Well, I'll just offer, so we're, uh, yeah, we're not quite balanced yet. Uh, we'll be bringing, uh, in late July, you'll have a tentative budget adoption and we'll continue to work to bring this in uh, to, to be fully balanced before we'd ask the board to vote on the budget. Uh, it's, you know, it's for the size of our budget, as Ms. Canoe said, that we're not alarmed at this point. Uh, we think we want to see how things play out. We're going to be closing the books on this year with fund balance. Uh, we'll be watching the tax roll closely and we'll be looking for opportunities to shave dollars down and get this thing balanced. Uh, but. You know, I guess our main point was this is this is not a bad place to be for May 8th, <laughs> and uh, yeah. we'll, we'll keep working on it. Uh, I also wanted to mention, you know, uh, Dr. Fenoy dedicated some co a considerable amount of time to sit with every department head and scrub through their, their current budgets and their budget requests for next year. Um, Dr. LaCava joined us at the table. I know uh, Ms. McQuinn had a question about the, the non-instructional Director, you want to so there's uh, good afternoon, uh, board members. Uh, there's uh, two parts to that answer. The first one was that we uh, com we collapsed the uh, director of labor, and uh, Miss Parr uh, took two departments and made them one. So there's some savings there. <coughs> 
The second part is that we just went through a rigorous assessment through the Florida Sterling Council, and one of the things that they continued to mention in that report that you're gonna be getting very, very soon is that we do now have a very robust non-instructional marketing plan to hire AC and technicians, so they really wanted us to to dedicate some of that time in regards to looking at that. So that was another reason that I decided to uh, fund that uh, position with the savings from Mrs. Parr's uh, labor. And, uh, uh, doc, Dr. Robinson and then Mrs. Brill and then Mrs. Sanders. Okay. Thank you. I want to um, circle back. I think that I am um, just want to add some detail to Mrs. Andrew's question. So for me on slide 11, I really would like to have all the bullet points under each one of those items. Um, you know, it was it was moving kind of fast. I, I, most of the things I think that um, that I understood it would most likely support, but I just need to have that written out, <coughs> um, including the operational initiatives. And now specifically, the Broad residents I heard you mention, um, how much do Broad residents cost us? Because I thought br the Broad Foundation paid for the Broad residents. The Broad Foundation pays for a third of the cost. Just the, one third? Yes. Okay. Um, and then also to um, continue, I, am, I also have some concerns about adding these positions to both legal and to IG. I just, I need to have some kind of backup. I remember in days long, long ago, there was a presentation um, in your first go round as general counsel, there was a presentation on um, comparing the cost of outside counsel versus having additional people in-house. Um, you know, I, I, I just need to see some kind of thoughtful analysis on that to get me to, to the place of thinking that this is appropriate. The other thing that I wonder is, can we buy the level of expertise that we need for this amount of money, or are we going to then say, but we need somebody you know, with 35 years of experience in this area of the fight as an outside counsel after we hire this person? So, I mean, I just have some <laughs> concerns um, about adding those positions. And then um, the other thing is, I've had this conversation with Dr. Fenoy and others, um, are we looking under any of these these enumerated items on slide 11, I didn't hear it said, are we looking to have somebody whose focus, whose job it is to look at and push us towards equity? Was that, is that in here somewhere? Yes, that's under the, the first bullet within the 3.4 million, there's a manager position to support the work with equity and access. Okay, did we do that job description already? No, okay. Because I, okay, I'm just making sure I'm not sleep at the wheel. No. Okay. I mean, it would be under, uh, it would be supervised under Carlene Mellon. Okay, and so when do we expect that job? Because I want to debate that job description. So when do we expect that to come forward? Good afternoon. I met with Mark Mitchell yesterday to because first I had to find out did we have a, an old job description because that department um, with the work that needs to be done and he put me in contact with the current, I got a printout of the current manager positions that do work for example in Diana Fetterman's office and so no it hasn't been created. I had to find out did one exist in the past first and so we had our meeting yesterday. I have a meeting scheduled back with him after pulling other equity directors or managers position in several of our surrounding um, districts to get some of that work so that will be coming forth. Yes, and that was my next part. We Once I get that information together, I plan to actually um, socialize that with each of the board members. But right now it's just a matter of finding out what we currently have, and now that I know that we don't have that, drafting that and then trying to make sure it's approved, um, hopefully by the one of the June board meetings. Okay, that's so the goal. Mr. Show, may I yes, ma'am. Finish. So um, I appreciate that. I, I've had this conversation with Dr. Fenoy. I can't remember if I had it with our deputy, um, but for me, the work of equ equity is much bigger than HR. Mm -hmm. And like, no disrespect. I mean, mm -hmm. 
I, in my in my world, this this person who's going to focus on equity would report to either the deputy or the superintendent. Um, like, and I don't care what you call them. Like, I like I'm not I don't do levels well. So chief, manager, director, whatever. I'm talking about the work and who they report to because it's much larger than HR. So I I would suggest that maybe we consider having some board workshop so the board can discuss. Um, what that looks like before you spend um, much more time um, investing in outlining the job description that at least as I'm hearing it, that I'm gonna push against, so thank you. All right, Mrs. Andrews and then Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you, uh, Dr. Robinson, for actually adding to that because I'm really concerned. I'm in this building uh, meeting with people all the time and I like that we're doing these things, but for all of these departments and all of these initiatives, there should have been some kind of communications with the board member to kind of go over this. We're kind of doing it quickly now in this, this budget overview, but there's so much meat in all of this when we decide to say we're gonna make these changes and spend this kind of money, and then I get this at a board meeting without really having some kind of conversation with all of the directors that are actually involved in this. And it makes me feel very inadequate to say that this is what I really want to do, and I'm hearing some comments from others here. So, you know, as, if this is going forward, I, will, I would request that I get a chance, and I don't know if the other board members to meet with all these department heads and find out what is this, what's the underlying information as to why as a district we're going in this direction. I'd like the uh, one on the operational initiatives because I'm gonna be talking about maintenance today, but I, and I like a lot of these others, but then you have to educate me before you just put this out here because the conversation could have been different if we had spoken to the directors, if we knew we were going in this direction with having it all printed out here today. So next time, if we can do something like that, and even with this, maybe schedule for me so that I can meet and find out what's going on in each one of these departments. And just like you said, you've been uh, identified as being weak in some areas. So I wish I could have known that because that could help me better support this. Thank you. This is Whitfield. Thank you. Um, so uh, similarly in this section, um, just to add on to that, the, the one, two, three, four, I know these are the goals that we have set for the uh, organization, and this isn't really on you guys, but I feel like it would be nice to understand how well we're meeting those goals right now. Like, are, we at, are these tasks actually um, something that we are achieving? And if we are achieving them, how well? Um, this new funding, why would we think that this new funding would go towards making it better? Um, what, what are we missing? I, I just would like to have both of those things to compare, not just the budget, but, but really the outcomes that we were asking for and whether or not we're actually getting there. Thanks. Mrs. McQuinn. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna do run on sentence here. So I, I'm going back again to general counsel. I 100% I agree that we have much more charter school litigation. We know that's on our plates. Um, and, and so I know that we need help there rather than going outside. And so I, I think, it, I don't remember who asked for the cost analysis for that, but great, I wanted to weigh in on that. Um, the other is, I don't often disagree with um, my colleague, Mrs. Andrews, it, part of it I do, but I just know that if every one of us meets with every department and then I still don't know what my colleagues think, and more to my point, I want the public to hear the discussion. Mm -hmm. That's why I didn't give a heads up mm -hmm. to general counsel or to um, Dr. LaCava. I want the public to hear what they have already mm -hmm. thought out. So I like that open discussion. I know it's uncomfortable, but I think it's being a good steward of our money. Uh, the other is, I honestly have given thought since our last board meeting in terms of Dr. Robinson's ongoing vote against contracts um, it, it, because of the equity issue. And I go back again, I'm almost through, I go back again to one of my first school board meetings when we were pretty much um, more than our hands slapped over not meeting equity goals. And I'm to the point almost that I want to vote against all of those contracts until we meet equity goals. And yet I know we can't shut down the business of the district. So to Ms. Whitfield's point, I think we need an update. Where are we? Mrs. Brill. Thank you. And all of this ties into what I was going to say. So, uh, you know, I think that well, I'm having a discussion item afterwards about a workshop. 
Um, along with that, I think this whole conversation is screaming workshop where we really just sit down, talk about, because this organization has evolved. We do have new initiatives. As Dr. Robinson said, I would like to see what the thought process is, even though you know, when it comes to statute, we have our three reports. We do have to be involved with the whole layout of the organization. Um, recently, we had some new job descriptions, and I did speak to Dr. Fenoy because we were not receiving the organization chart. And I had said to him that the organization chart's not ingrained in my brain, and it turned out we were moving one department, which ultimately got moved back. But I, I would like to request that after we have our board discussion, that we look to you know setting up a workshop where we can talk about these new initiatives, talk about what the vision is, give our input, and as Dr. Robinson said, see you know what the reporting relationships are going to be, and maybe work in the budget too. But you know, I, I believe, as Mrs. McQuinn said, we need to have these conversations in public. I know that Dr. Fenoy is very comfortable with the fact that we just don't rubber stamp, that we sit here and we give input. So if we could put that down as a want, that we want to have a workshop, and if you can tailor that into something that makes sense, I would appreciate it. Yeah. Um, Mr. Oswald wanted to respond on that one, and then Mrs. Andrews. Yeah, I want to thank the board members for your comments. We'll break down, we'll have staff will break down that and come back to you all with further, further how these items are being spent. We spent numerous meetings really looking at our strategic plan and how, how we're spending these dollars are in alignment of a specific initiatives. You heard Mr. Burke talk about the position that's the testing coordinator. We've heard, you know, we've had numerous issues really looking at around when it comes to testing. So. We'll break each of those down, explain how they align to our goals. This summer we'll do an update instru uh, instructional workshop about once the test results come out, how we're aligning to those goals. So, this is Ann. Mrs. Andrews. And just to follow up, because I love Mrs. McQuinn, I'm definitely transparent, but when we come up with these kind, this kind of information, I would like to have some backup information, and if I needed to speak with the deputy or the superintendent, I could have that information. Surely I want the public to see what the proposals are. We may or may not agree, but I do believe we have to educate the board so that when we're sitting in here for an hour's <laughs> workshop, we have that backup information and the, and the knowledge and the information so that we can ask the right questions before making the decisions. So I still may be meeting, but I definitely want to have backup information. Ms. Rico. Thank you. So um, I just wanted to make uh, one, bring something to your attention that Dr. Robinson um, m m clicked in my mind. Usually by this time of year, I, will have, I would have had my end of the year report, and so that breakdown and trend analysis and comparison, which we have, really sort of a mythical comparison now. Back when we first started doing it, it was a real comparison to actual outside council fees. Now we have it based against a mythical hourly if we had taken it out. Um, and this year my evaluation is in September, so it just clicked in my mind that you didn't get that report. Um, so I'll be happy to break down those dollars and do those, do those projections for you. Um, and, um, and get that to you so that you can see the, uh, the trending Burke. that we have. Thank you. Yeah, uh, first of all, yeah, it sounds like we probably need to do a, a workshop dedicated to uh, department budget requests for, for next year. We did spend, uh, you know, we had a three-hour session with the Budget Advisory Committee where we went through the breakdown of what's behind all these numbers in detail, and uh, those slides are in the appendix. You have to s go past what we plan to present here today, past discussion, you'll see some appendix slides. That's just going to show you detail on what ultimately was approved. Uh, there were department requests and other things that the superintendent went through and uh, we were unable to fund. Uh, with the exception of school police, we're trying to make sure we do everything uh, the school police needs and uh, we're, we're working through that. Uh, so to spend some more time on it is, is no problem for staff. We have that. Uh, Ms. Knudsen and her team did a nice job of uh, shepherding that process where we capture all the department requests, uh, link them to the strategic plan and then the superintendent ultimately went through along with uh, the deputy superintendent and the leadership team and decided you know what was going to be brought forward or not so uh, we'll just have to try to get some time we've got time fortunately you know you're not going to be asked to take action on this budget till uh, late july so we should have time to be able to get that session scheduled right. and there is that that vodcast of the budget advisory committee meetings out there if, if people are interested and want to go back and see that right. a couple observations first one is on the positions and 
uh, the attorneys related and the comment was made about charter schools. We have a charter school department and, and historically they've been, they do all of the, um, the, the contract reviews and, and everything. So I would like to have more discussion about is that a change from what we've done or not. So that's just some information. The comment I'm about to make is one that's, that's intended for four years from now because there's a major issue that this board has got to be prepared for and that's with the approval of, of 7123, the impact is gonna start immediately. So I'd like to ask staff, and I, I did talk to Mr. Burke with this, so I think he's got this list, but this is so the public's aware of the impact of what could happen. I'd like to ask for some very specific things. The first one is, I would like the board to get information on the financial status of every one of the charter schools, if there are any charter schools that are in, uh, I don't wanna say financial uh, stress, but a, an update on the financial um, status of our charter schools. The ones that are in, in good financials, not a big deal. The second piece is, I'd like for us to have some information on the number of teachers that are in charter schools in this county that are either, either totally non-certified to be teaching or the number of schools that are using day-to-day -day substitutes. Because if there's an expectation for these teachers in the future to receive um, money and salary, we need to have some idea on how the accountability. The third item is that I'd like for us to um, have a review of all of the charter schools, um, find their, their compliance with all of the safety requirements that are required in both the safety bill district requirements and so that we have some assurances that we're in compliance with the new requirements of the law. But specifically, how are we gonna enforce those, um, those requirements? The, th the next part is that in the event that something doesn't happen in the next four years legislatively, um, some uh, plan on how the staff recommends that the accountability uh, be provided by these charter schools for the use of the money. The bill requires that charter schools have to spend it for the reasons that are stated, but right now there's nothing in place for that to happen unless we create it. And if it's IROC or whatever that mechanism is, we need to deal with that and start planning. And a plan that's, that go forward from today on that all new charter school contracts include language that this board would expect so they would be in compliance with whatever our expectations are in the event that we have to, um, that we have to do that. Mr. Burke, did I cover all the things that we had talked about? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Ms. Rico? Mr. Shaw, your, your comments just forced me to, 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 to ask to uh, be heard on this subject. So when, when we were talking about this additional litigation attorney, although there was contemplated some charter school litigation as we have had in the past, um, it also contemplates this other EEO and, and employment. But as you've commented on the charter school accountability piece, the litigation and extraordinary litigation that we had this year over the accountability and holding um, the board's decision to terminate a charter, a, a charter school um, caused over $50,000 in outside attorney's fees. Why? Due to the fact that at the same time, there were over four lawsuits filed by that very charter school to try to bo block this board's decision to hold them accountable for um, extreme financial mismanagement. We are now facing five lawsuits. Um, the additional one is, in, is bankruptcy, um, and uh, that has caused us to um, add an additional outside counsel for the expertise of bankruptcy, because you have to be certified in bankruptcy court to, to participate in that uh, process. So that's an example of um, what happens when the board um, takes steps to hold their accountability and what can happen in terms of the resultant litigation. And we don't have the staff to uh, litigate for uh, complex law lawsuits at the same time, and that's what causes to go outside. So that's just an example of, of where um, this goes in our office. Right. Mrs. McQuinn. 
one more thing to add to um, Mr. Shaw's um, what, whatever discussion we're going to have about the charter school accountability. And for me, that's what it's about, it's accountability. So um, what I, I don't know if we're allowed to know, but in terms of can we know what their teachers are paid, their, their salary structure, schedule, also their administrators. And I have spoken with two um, charter school members of their boards in terms of transparency about how much they pay for non-classroom um, salaries because in one situation over four years, one of those salaries could have paid a half a million dollar project. So I, I want that, I want that information and I want the public to have that information at, if we're allowed to have it. And I, I think the answer to that is we are. All of their salaries are public information. So uh, Dr. Robinson. Thank you, so I really just wanted to um, apologize to staff because I stopped looking when it said discussion. So I didn't see the appendix part. So I see you have a lot of that outlined, but I, I do hope that we have the workshop so that we can kind of dig into it, um, into it more. Um, the other thing is that um, I, I also need to hear about the expansion of what was formerly called MTSS. Now I think it's called Behavior Coach, which is not the same as the what are they called, mental health professionals? I mean, we, and I think at some point, I think we probably need to look at the layering of these services um, because we, we do have layers of services, um, but I, I'm going to maintain that the former MTSS, now known as behavior coaches, are, they're the foundation of this work. Um, and I will um, continue to, to push and fight and scrap and claw or whatever I need to do until we have one in every school. I get what Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, the law said, and we're complying with that, but I'm, I'm talking about the people who um, really will prevent problems and not just diagnose them. So I, I need to see that. Um, when we come back and have that the conversation because um, it's only been mm, nine years, I think, that I've been fighting about this. And I think that we have consensus, we've had consensus on the board about this. And I think that I've been clear um, about the difference in these positions. And if I need to draw pictures for the workshop, I'll be happy to do that. However, I need to explain this because I need people to understand that we have to have the foundational work being done too. So I'd like to see that expansion, Mr. Deputy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, just one quick, just to make sure, when I talked about the issue of compliance with charter schools on uh, safety, uh, that also includes a review of the hardening issue of the schools because we have charter schools that are located in a, quite a variety of different locations and, and Chief Kitzrow and I had that conversation. Mr. Burke, capital budget. Okay, thanks. I think, uh, yeah, I think we pretty much covered the operating budget. We'll be back again with a follow-up workshop. Uh, I'm gonna hand it over to Ms. Evans and uh, take it away. Good afternoon. So the capital budget, um, this is actually the first time you've seen the capital plan this early. We usually bring it to you in July. So we're a couple months ahead of schedule. Um, so this is the capital plan. You're, you've had a 10 year plan, we've just added one more year on. So this slide is really pointing out the changes we've made from last year's plan. So the significant changes, um, we've increased um, the money for air conditioning significantly. And that's gonna be funded with um, borrowing, two um, five-year borrowings that we'll be doing in FY20 and 21 to pay for that. We're also increasing the funding for computers um, to address end-of-life issue for units with the Windows 7 operating system. When we developed this plan, we had planned to do it with two three-year borrowings and as the finance, the person that does the investment in debt for you, I tell you that's really not the best way of doing it. And if we have any wiggle room in the capital plan, which we do now for FY20, it's going to go to buy the computers rather than finance them. If you think about it, if we're paying for them over three years, at the end of three years, they don't have a lot of life left in them. It just doesn't make sense to do that. So we're trying to find a better way of doing that. Um, for the building, we're doing an, a remodel for school police and an emergency operations center that's been added to the plan. 
um, a modular addition for South Intensive, a modular addition for Sunset Palms, grade six through eight to be used until the middle school's been approved, which doesn't really need to be approved by DOE anymore. So that's something we're looking at. Wi-Fi on school buses, and that's going to accomplish two things. First of all, it's gonna give the students access to do homework on the way home. It will have the same filters that they have in the classroom, so it's not a wide open Wi-Fi environment. It will also give access to school to police to be able to monitor cameras on the buses, and those, open, those are going to be added in as well. And then increased funding for musical instruments, which is long overdue. So that's the significant changes. Um, we've given you a list of the construction projects, and I just wanna point out the ones in italics are the ones on the referendum project list. The ones that are in bold are new to the plan, and I've mentioned all of them already with the exception of transportation west central at Skies Road, and that's something we'll be talking with the sales tax oversight committee as well. When we did the referendum project list, we had north transportation, south transportation, and west central. If you remember, the two north and south were at 12.5 million, the west central was at 15. It was higher because we didn't know if we'd have approval to build the, the transportation complex at, at um, Skies Road. Now that we do, we're breaking that out. So 12.5 will go to that new complex and 2.5 stays with the original west central, which was always our plan. We just couldn't do that till we had county approval. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you. Um, could you. Could somebody tell me if we're going to get uh, a module or if we're gonna get some support for Crossroads Academy? I think there has been some discussion about some improvements over here at, over there at Crossroads Academy. So wh where is that in here? Um, I don't know if that's in here. I, I know, know I, Superintendent, I've been part of uh, conversations with Superintendent Miss Paul about uh, providing them some more space for the school administration and uh, you know, some enhancements there. I know he's visited the school and had some concerns, so I I'm not sure that's fully gelled yet, but I believe Ms. Paul is working on it. Typically, we put the projects on when it is essentially an addition. So it's not just one portable or two portables, it's, a, it's an addition, like a building. We lift it here. Otherwise, there's money in the capital plan specifically for moving portables and moving modular classrooms. They're not usually identified one by one on the plan because Quite frankly, we don't know what the request is gonna be for two years from now. So when we look at this long-term plan, there is a bucket of money available to move portables. And I'm sure, I'm certain that's how it would be funded. But to this date, I don't, I don't have the details on Crossroads. <clears throat> well, I'd like a little bit more information because it's an emergency situation out there with um, the school. Ms. Andrews, we are aware of that. We've done some work at Crossroads. Our intent is to try to replace that first portable uh, where they use it as administration. And so we're trying to work the plan as we speak on that. This is Burrell. Thank you, and this question's for Mr. Burke. I became so focused, my obsession was House Bill 7123, that I lost track, and I want to confirm this, with the exempting of projects funded by local capital outlay millage from the educational plant survey, does that mean we're gonna be able to build Sunset Palms Middle School? Does that fall under that? Yay! Yes, yes it does. Okay. <laughs> so. Right, so this plan shows you like two options. You know, we had, uh, we could just do the expansion of the elementary school or the, the complete middle school. The, the door has been open to do the whole middle so school. So as a follow-up, I'd like to make sure that we have a com conversation rather soon because Krista McAuliffe is bursting at the seams. And, and I truly believe that once we build that middle school, we may see one of the charter schools that we're having some issues with close. So I would one appreciate that. One of the things that. that I was going to mention later on, but I'll just bring it up right now, we were thrilled with the legislative change and we're hopeful, but didn't really know if it was going to be there. So Still the plan you have in front of you doesn't include potential changes that we could have. So I've already had one meeting with facilities. I know that they're meeting pretty much consistently on what projects will need to change, reevaluating projects based on the new flexibility that we have. There are some instances where we were building a school in a certain way to meet the law, and now the law has changed. We may have a more effective and efficient way of doing it now that we're out of those boxes. So we'll be coming back to you with updates. And we need the governor to sign off and Absolutely. make that and law. As a follow-up, um, I would like to request that we also explore the possibility of a public-private partnership in order to expedite the building. 
So uh, as we speak through these and work through these uh, new developments, uh, we're definitely looking at all options uh, to that point, but I'm just waiting for the governor to sign. But we are, <laughs> we are working on kind of several, <laughs> working on several options. All right, Mrs. McQuinn, Dr. Robinson. Okay, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. The, um, so the modular, where is it? The modular addition for South Intensive, what is that? Uh, is that a short-term fix? Do we have a long-term fix? I guess I'll just, I, I'll just stay here. I think we <laughs> yeah. got an okay. ensemble cast here today. <laughs> so what we're exploring now is we have uh, excess concretables in the district, and so uh, based on the new legislation, once the governor signs, we're trying to see what flexibility we have in moving those buildings, be buildings around and possibly creating a new school uh, through the, the modulars. Uh, at this time, again, you know, we want to see if we have permission or will be granted permission to move those buildings to that site and hopefully demo the rest of the site and basically create a new, new uh, a learning space for those kids. I have more. Dr. Robinson. So then um, I think you kind of mentioned it. So the new legislation, does it change the rules on requiring permission for demolition too? Not, not to my knowledge, okay. not to my knowledge, but because that's a unique space uh, and it's not per se a school, it's a former church, uh, we are investigating whether we would have to go through that process as we would for a normal school. Okay, and then one more for now. Um, then I don't see on here, well, maybe it's premature, but we, I think we're gonna have a workshop on the Conservatory High School. Am I correct? Mr. Oswald? Yes, uh, the board gave a recommendation for staff to come back with some recommendations for a potential conservatory high school. So staff's working on that now. We'll be coming back at a future date. Okay, so be, it would be my hope that we would be able to give clear direction so by the time we adopt the budget in September, it's either in, which I hope it's in, or we know it's out based on board direction. But yeah, so we can explore that. And I'm gonna ease one more question in. So the musical instruments, Yes. are we, are we going back to the good old days where all children can take music? We're going to have money in every school's budget for musical instruments. For each child, or for What's five that? children per school. I mean, tell me what we're talking it's, about. I don't, it's like a, we're, we're at a beginning place to provide monies for each school. I don't think it will cover for every student. Okay, so as a follow-up, would you give me an estimate in writing later? Yes. What percentage of children I can expect will have musical instruments provided to them by their school for August 2019? Okay. This is Whitefield. Do you know the Just since we're talking, since you mentioned the musical instruments, I feel like I read somewhere that you had added in some money for art supplies too for the first time in forever and ever and ever. I just publicly thank you. Holy heck. <laughs> I'm so excited. Uh, thank you. Yes, we have. And, uh, you know, just this budget in general, thanks to the voters of Palm Beach County, is one of the, the best budgets we've been able to put together for some time and address some of those things that have been outstanding for years. So, and particularly the arts and with the musical instruments, uh, the principals were really pleased to hear some of this information. So we're and the musical instruments, I know it's going from 140,000 a year to 1.5 million a year. So it's more than 10 times. It's, it, it's going from $140,000 a year district-wide to 1.5 million a year. So it's a significant increase. Magnet charter, I mean, magnet choice. Excluding yeah, this is just a line item for musical instruments. So it's on top of anything that's out there now. And the thought is it'll be a recurring 1.5 million every year so that the schools can plan and replace and upgrade their instruments, you know. Yeah, just another piece of information. This was a legislative win that we had that stayed completely under the radar the entire legislative session. Um, but the language that was literally written um, really relating to the lease purchase exclusion from having to be in compliance with the uh, per pupil station was actually literally written at night by Ron LaFace and Megan White. So our, our lobbyists were the ones who wrote that legislation and filed it at about 11 o'clock. They wrote it overnight and at eight o'clock the next morning filed the legislation. So Mr. Burke, okay, dead service. 
stop. Okay. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Mr. Burke, that service. Yes, so this is Ms. Evans' favorite slide. I, I have to let her take it. It, it, it is. Um, and I just want to point out, we're using COPS to finance most of the construction projects and site, site acquisition. Um, we have four short-term debt issues that are included, two for um, computers and two for air conditioning. I'm hoping that it's only one for computers by the time we balanced. Um, there's one other item that'll be added. Um, you have an agenda item later in your special meeting today regarding the sales tax financing. And we're um, happy, and you'll, you'll see that later today, but um, we're happy that the cost of that will fit within the interest earnings. So it would not come out of project cost for sales tax. So you'll see that later today. That was, uh, went to the finance committee about a week or two ago. Yeah. It's a really positive thing to have that type of flexibility and spending authority at virtually right. no cost to us. So right. Ms. Evans is uh, humble here. She did a really nice job with that. It, it did turn out really nice. Um, it's going to allow us, normally, you have to have the cash in the bank before you can issue a contract. So when you look at a high school, it's gonna be done over three years. So either we had to wait and prolong those projects or some, so find a way to bring that money in early. So. Cash flow wise, we don't really need it, but to comply with state law, we do. So the borrowing rate, assuming we don't actually need the cash, is 0.1%. So it's, it's a really good transaction and I'll give the, the plug to PNC for the one they submitted the great bid. So we're very happy about that. Okay, so the variables on the capital budget, things that we're still waiting on, very similar to what Ms. Canoose talked about, the tax roll, um, that does directly impact capital because the 1.5 mils comes here. Um, for capital, so we're waiting for that. State funding for capital charter, charter school capital outlay, we did have good news there that the state fully funded that. So that's $10 million in the budget that we don't need to send to charters this year. That's going to help offset that borrowing for computers. Um, the bad news is the PICO funds that have been forecast over the 10 years, um, the state did not fund that this year. That's about $3.5 million reduction for this year. It's $45 million over the 10 year window. So it does have a significant impact to us. Um, impact fees, you know we have good news there. That was approved by the county. We're working with county staff to finalize um, what those budget numbers should be. Um, and we're, we're, we've already factored in some, some numbers, not in the version you have, but the next one you see will have that included. It's going to help offset the PICO funds and some of the other challenges we face. Legislative issues, we have a lot of work to do. Um, once the governor signs off on that bill, um, we have a lot of things to evaluate. So you'll see for, fight, for tentative adoption, you will have, we'll have some changes and we'll outline what those are. So you'll be able to see clearly what changes we made. Um, we are looking in the future for additional needs for maintenance, um, staff, preventive maintenance. We wanna make sure we can avoid another backlog if possible. And that's a significant concern. Um, between IT and ed technology, um, they've asked for some additional money to get us to a one-to-one -one ratio for students and computers. They'd like to have an extra $4 million a year starting in FY21. So it doesn't impact this next year capital budget, but it's something we're trying to plan on for next year so that we can get to that goal. And one of the big concerns we have is rising construction costs. We are seeing that on every project that's being bid. So it's something we're monitoring very closely. And to echo on the sentiment, the, the budget does look good. We've been able to put in a lot of things that people have asked for. A lot of it, vast majority of the budget, it's still from the sales tax referendum. So again, we thank the voters of Palm Beach County for approving that. And it's helping to address all the deferred maintenance items that are out there. So that money is dedicated to specific projects. And we're working with ISOC to make sure we report that back to the public regularly. Yeah. And uh, that I'll hand it back to Mr. Burke. Hey, Ms. Evans, and yes. if, just to be sure that I'm accurate in this, even though PICO funds were not included for regular um, school district operations, I believe it was $158 million that was put in for charter school capital outlay. That's correct. And, and the good news is we don't have to, that takes us off the hook from providing any of the capital outlay millage money locally, but. Uh, yeah, that was a hit. We usually pick right. up a few million, right? Yeah, it's two, usually about two and a half, two point seven million dollars for maintenance that we will not receive this year. Um, we've pretty covered, pretty much covered it, Vice Chairman Shaw. Uh, we had a slide here with our highlights. Uh, we've we've covered this again. It was really the referendum that made this uh, such a positive budget. Um, we have the timeline laid out. Uh, the the Budget Advisory Committee has spent a considerable amount of time going through this, and they'll be working in June to finalize their annual report to the board. Uh, and they've been supportive to date of everything that's been recommended. Uh, and then we'll work to get another workshop scheduled so that we can uh, follow up to those questions that were raised today. And I think we've covered it. All right.
Thank you very much. We really do appreciate all the work that goes into this. And this was a, a good start for us with questions. So the deliverables from this meeting uh, was a request from the board for a budget workshop, a review of uh, the, the information related to charter schools for future planning, and uh, some of the issues that were, were brought up by board members related to personnel requests in the budget. So with that, we'll move to our next item, which is the um, uh, workshop for policy uh, 5.74. Mr. Oswald. Yeah, our second workshop is 5.74, students experiencing homelessness. I ask Dr. Licata and the rest of the team to come on up for this workshop. And I wanna draw the board's attention, this particular policy will also have its first read tonight due to a recent audit. It's important that we uh, put this on the docket to get the updated changes. And I'll turn over to Dr. Licata and the team to talk about the changes in this policy. As I'm trying to pull it up, give me one moment, please. Well, Mr. Oswald is given that. I heard this morning that the uh, District Court of Appeals, I believe, whoever's handling the old bill 7069, uh, there was indication that came out this morning that that bill is now scheduled to be heard by the courts. And that's what, that's three, four years ago, right? That that, that, that challenge was made in 7069. Good afternoon, school board. Deputy Superintendent. Um, we are presenting a policy today that is a change in legislation and they are requiring us to update our policy. And this is a, a, a good subject because it, it talks about uh, some of our most fragile students. And uh, up here we have Elisa Carmona from Legal and we have the two uh, folks that really support the homelessness in our district, Ms. Beth Leffler and Dr. Aurora Francois, along with June Issa is up as well. Um, we will move through this quickly because I believe you may have some questions. We tried to identify uh, those questions. So the last time this was adopted was July 7th, 2010, and now we're going to go ahead and start the process again today. If you see the growth in homelessness uh, in our district, it's real. It's not a fabricated situation. What's uh, difficult about this number is that's the only the identified students. We are doing everything with outreaches and, and, and trying to workshop with our principals and school staff on identifying, but if we aren't able to identify, we don't know the number out there. So we are gonna continue to work on that and try and bring that forward to the principals again next year and some of the counselors as we do already. The definition is pretty broad when it comes to homelessness. And it should be because as we uh, define it in our own heads, we have to be pretty broad on how the state sees it. And it's not just that stereotype of a homelessness. There is a lot of students that are moving and transitioning through the areas or transitioning because of their family. They really need to be considered that as well. Here are some of the bigger terms for it. Uh, that has not changed much at all. Um, there are some gray areas in the previous uh, statute, and that's what we are addressing through this. We're making sure that there is no gray areas when it comes to the barriers. Uh, I believe we have extended ourselves as far as possible in order to accommodate any, any student that appears to be homelessness or homeless in that manner. We don't wanna make that decision. We wanna make sure that they are protected and given all the rights through that, including those parameters there. Here's some of the revisions, and these revisions are uh, important. Uh, as you can see, the preschool education is, is one that jumps out at you right away. Of course, it's uh, district administered. If you go to school of origin, it really talks about the pathway of that child, and not to disrupt that pathway. We continually make sure that the child moves through the pathway of the school that's most convenient or localized through that in the feeder pattern. However, there are times when it's more convenient, especially when you're talking foster children, that it's more convenient to move them to a school that might be nearby if they're traveling at distance. We make every effort to make it at the right break and make sure it's the right move. Uh, these, these students usually don't have a lot of representation and our, our representation is really what they have. And we wanna make sure that we're making the decision that's best educationally for them, travel time, so forth and so on. We cannot deny them any services. We try and provide additional counseling services and as we talked earlier in the meeting as Dr. Robinson brought up, we still need to counsel and be there for every student. 
Um, disputes are uh, unique. We rarely do we have a dispute when it comes to homelessness because we always want to err on the side of the child. But the legislation is very clear now that there is a dispute resolution process and it leans on the child for what's ever best for them. Uh, that is not something we've had difficulty with. Again, these are uh, required updates to the policy. We've been doing this and we're gonna continue doing this and we're gonna stay within, um, well, Ms. Ms. Whitfield, yeah. oh, I'm sorry. Um, and finally, all the services, including grade transfers, that seems to be one of the difficult ones. Students coming from homelessness that are moving from school to school or district to district, aren't going to have all their files, may not have an awareness of where they are kept or what their folders look like or how many credits they have. We have to go beyond just the normal student coming through the door and extend whatever we can and do our research at the school level. That is clearly spelled out. I see that being one of the biggest barriers because as students get behind in their credits or not aware of their credits, we know what that leads to. So this is more of just documenting what the, what the statute says. We're in compliance with it and we're gonna continue being in compliance with it. But I really wanna thank the two ladies to my right because this is their work and this is their creation and they, they uh, eat, sleep and drink it every single day. So thank you ladies. Mrs. Whitefield. Thank you, thank you guys so much for everything you do. Honestly, it's God's work that you're doing um, to work with these children every day. Um, this is such a great opportunity um, as the representative for the Homeless Advisory Board from this this board um, for me to talk really briefly about some of the things that I would love to see happen in this area. Um, the first thing that I think is really important is I feel like we're missing an opportunity to partner better with the county. Um, we. They do a point in time count every year. We don't seem to be a part of that. Um, the thing that's frustrating about that is that they are reporting to the country and to us locally here um, what the numbers for the homeless people are in the community, but they are not including the numbers that we have. And granted, we count differently than they do. Um, I think there's still a way for us to be involved in that point in time count. And I think we need to find a way to recognize the students in our community who are living in transitional housing, like we mentioned in this. Um, I think it's fabulous that McKinney Vento um, keeps children in their schools if they can. Um, I think, you you know, when they're going through a tough time, it's great to have their teachers around them. That makes me really happy that we that we do that work. But I think we have so much more to do for these students than just what McKinney Vento um, allows us to do. And I think one of the ways that we can really tackle that is through the work with the county so that the county has offered, um, if we were able to give them numbers, that would help them with their fundraising ability for their ability to make sure that students who maybe aren't even just living in transitional housing but are living on the street because we have students that really are um, not under even a, a roof of any kind, um, that they would prioritize those children um, and to help us um, to make sure that those children get um, priority access to anything um, that, that they may have resources for within the community. So they would like to um, do that. So I think there's a lot of uh, things that we have to figure out a way to do. I think that the way that we do this is probably through a data sharing agreement. I think we have to find a way to uh, make sure that that happens with the county um, so that there can be some sharing of the numbers that, we, that we're having there. So I think that's really important. Um, and uh, so for that, we need to talk to James Green and the county. Thank you. Uh, just a follow up to that. I was fortunate uh, to attend a panel discussion earlier this year, and I, I believe you were at it. And um, it was astounding to see the amount of adults that are homeless and to realize what the average cost just the rent in this county is. And when you talk about the adults, they looked at me and said, they have children and they go to your schools. One of the things we've looked at over the years and as we bring choice up in uh, the next month or two, we've always addressed that foster children have an extra advantage to get in and perhaps we should look at or be directed to to maybe add that in as well for any homeless student to have an opportunity to uh, enjoy what we provide in choice as well. This is what I feel. You just reminded me of one other thing. Um, Dr. LaCava was working previously on something to do with housing and we had been discussing some of these things about um, partnering to make sure that people in our community, because we actually have homeless people who work for us, which just blows my mind. Um, so if we could um, at least try to continue that work, if it's something you're still um, 
working on and um, the, the communities are trying to find ways to create workforce housing and housing for our lowest income workers and um, you know things like that I think then you build the community around the children so when we have you know, families that make very, very low income, they still have a roof to put over their head. And in this community where it's getting so expensive to live, um, I think that's one way to tackle one of these issues is, is for people who are really, you know, trying to be employed, um, that we try to help them to find affordable housing. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you, and you still have your uh, homeless liaisons. Uh, are they located in the different areas of the county? Ms. Leffler. Hi, I'm the homeless liaison. We have nine McKinney Vento case managers that mm -hmm. work throughout the county mm -hmm. to service our schools. Yeah, I was just wondering where they where are they located? Are they located in the different regions of the county, and do they have connections with um, the cities? Um, for instance, the Glades region and Pahokee region. I know they're in the schools and they're located probably maybe at a school? I think one of our greatest relationships actually is in the Glades. Um, mm -hmm. We have a very strong case manager for Nell Williams, DeSrosier, who uh, is well connected with everyone out there. We're talking to the housing authority. We're talking to other folks. I think we do have a relationship out there, mm -hmm. a strong one. Okay, that's just one area. I just wondered if they were working with the, the cities and the communities. I think we do a better job with the Glades than elsewhere. Okay, I'll be checking. Mrs. Brill. Thank you, and I'm sure you're looking at this, but to to piggyback on what my colleagues have said, you know, one of the populations of homeless is when our children in foster care age out. Mm -hmm. Because once they age out at age 18, they have no place to go. And so as part of that affordable housing discussion and as far as wraparound services, I think we do need to pay a little extra attention to those students that are nearing graduation age, that are 18 or older, that are in foster care to make sure that we keep things in place for them. Um, as much as we can and partner with the county to make sure that they have a roof over their heads. Thank mm -hmm. you. So, you know, I had the opportunity to meet with our president of Palm Beach State College, Dr. Uh, Mr., uh, Ms. Parker, and um, we also started contemplating to build some type of partnership to ease the transition for current identified uh, homeless students as they transition into Palm Beach State. So we started that conversation. And also we've been very fortunate to receive a lot of supplies uh, from some of our community uh, partners and to again disseminate uh, to that specific group uh, of, of, of kids. Okay. I was glad to see in the policy um, the item that dealt with, with dealing with the eligibility issue of kids especially. Um, I had a, a very interesting conversation about a month ago with a parent who was not in Palm Beach County, but who had a foster child in their house who was um, going through some very severe emotionally pro emotional problems and was in the process of being reviewed for eligibility and stuff, and how that issue completely stopped as the child moved from one school to another. So that is a big issue, and I'm glad to see that that's being discussed. Mr. Oswald? Yeah, I wanna add to that. President uh, Kelly at Florida Atlantic University was recognized by Best Foot Forward because of their work with foster children. And they actually designate a full-time position to try to really increase the completion rates for our students who are enrolled at Florida Atlantic University in foster care. And also, uh, we will follow up with Mr. Green with the county to see how we can partner better around students who are homeless. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Our next topic, we have two discussion items, Mrs. Andrews. the penny sales tax and the work that's being done through the penny sales tax, but as I'm visiting schools and, and working with uh, the different individuals, I worry about being able to have an action plan for the future. Uh, the sales tax will be gone 
and what is our plan to take it to the next level? I, I look at the maintenance folks and I would like to know how we're recruiting. I love seeing in the budget the additional money for operational as well as the money for, um, for maintenance that I heard today. That's a good thought because I'm wondering if we're actually keeping up with what we need for a district of this size, the 10th largest in the, in the United States to be ready. And sometimes I'm looking at the painting jobs in the schools and I'm wondering if we have enough painters to come and do what has to be done. Some, some communities are actually having people come in and, and, and do a lot of work. I look at the, um, uh, some of the landscape work and, and, and the trees haven't been seen pruned in two years when I'm walking past stuff. So I just wonder, do we have the people to get the work done? We need to kind of get a good vision of what's happening in maintenance, even though we have this piece with the penny sales tax and we're doing a lot of uh, upgrades based on being behind. I just think we need to have a workshop to kind of see where we are and where we're going in the future. Thank you, Mrs. Whitefield. I just wanted to say, yay, I love this conversation and I would really, really love to see how we, when we have all the future employees of the school district here, in our schools right now. So why don't we figure out how we're gonna tie in some technical ed with that. So if we need diesel mechanics, we have that program, you know, things like that. So thank you for bringing that up. I saw a whole bunch of yeses on Mrs. Andrew's request for workshop and maintenance. All right, next uh, discussion item, Mrs. Brill. Thank you, and I'm sorry that I think Mr. Burke isn't here. Um, but I'm sure somebody will report back to him. So first of all, um, this isn't a new request for a workshop. We have already asked for a workshop regarding the Inspector General. It has not been set to date regarding the Office of Inspector General. Oh, good. Glad to have you back, Mr. Burke. We'll need you for this discussion. Um, so before this discussion is over, I've asked our board clerk to be prepared to set a date for us so that we can, we can get a date on the calendar for this discussion. Um, I would like to publicly let my colleagues know what I'm asking for in my asks and get their asks for this workshop or they can think about it and send it to Mr. Burke perhaps and Ms. Ms. Bass later on. Um, I think I envision this workshop as being very robust and I'm just, I will tell you why after I talk about my asks because for me there's two parts. First of all, our Inspector General is scheduled to retire within the next year. So from my perspective, we need to have a discussion of whether we continue along this path or whether we explore other opportunities. And so I am asking for a thorough cost analysis, this is in preparation for the workshop, a thorough cost analysis of our current structure, and that would be what the costs are for staffing internally, including but not limited to salaries and office space, as well as the added cost of outsourcing um, that we have done to Pinellas County, both past and current cases that are outsourced. So I'd like to, that to be very thorough. And then I'd also like to have Mr. Burke reach out to the County Inspector General's office, to dis, um, the County AG, I'm sorry, IG, to discuss our needs um, so that we can get an estimate of what the cost would be should we go under the County IG. So those two pieces I'd like to see. Um, and then I'd also like us to have a policy discussion because recently we had a case and, and I think that we need to, to take a look at the policy to determine whether the IG should be waiting for results when a case, when there's part of a case going to the Office of Professional Standards, you know, are we gonna wait to get the entire review done first rather than release part of it and move people around? So I think there's gonna be two robust conversations. One is about the actual office. If we keep the office the way it is, do we wanna have someone who shadows the Inspector General over the course of the next year? Um, are we going to look at going outside and then examining our policy? So I welcome everybody else's comments and then I would like to ask Ms. Bass to put something on the calendar. Mrs. Whitfield. Thank you. Um, it's so funny that Ms. Bro brings us up because I had just asked for the same discussion, but I put it for June 6th, so, um, so you beat me to it. Um, but I uh, similarly am excited to have this um, conversation with my colleagues. I think we have to be very clear about um, the direction that we're gonna head. Um, my understanding though, just to share with you all, um, is that um, since they are 
And since he is our employee, we are not really gonna have so much as a workshop as just a discussion uh, between all of us. Um, that's what I've heard from staff is that um, that we are gonna just have to discuss it. So maybe the time is set aside. Um, but as far as a workshop, I mean, Mr. Um, Burke has been working towards creating a cost analysis estimate from what I understand, and I know he's not quite done with it yet, um, but he has been putting that on his priority list um, uh, recently. And um, the other part of my understanding is that the county IG, if we were to get a, an analysis from him on how much it would be, that would take some some time um, for them to do it. So I think it's gonna end up becoming more of an, an RFP process. Um, so I'm looking forward to all of this. I just wanted to bring up those, those issues that I've come across um, as we were having this conversation today. This is Andrews. And thank you as we're discussing this, I guess I think back to when we started, when we didn't have anybody that had the certification. So we have to go back and look at why we went in the direction that we uh, went in uh, and how has it worked out based on uh, what we did, because we did discuss the county, we discussed a whole lot of things before we went in that direction. So somebody needs to just go back and get the little uh, historical uh, uh, minutes of why we did what we did and then to evaluate where we are. We uh, now, things have changed. We may have a whole lot of certified people that can actually uh, be able to fall right in and do whatever has to be done. So partnering with somebody else, uh, the county or some other agency or actually having our own IG, I'd like to look at the comparisons of all of those pieces. And since we have a little time before Mr. Uh, Chu is leaving, we can continue discussing this. Dr. Robinson, Mrs. Brill. So I just, again, wanna add a little detail to Mrs. Andrews' um, request. So I would like, as prior to such workshop, that we actually get the links of the meetings where the board discussed it. Because I'm sure the, the minutes are not gonna reflect the detail at all. I remember some of that conversation. Um, some of the conversation um, remains, and you know, I had some of the same concerns as I had then in terms of going outside, but I'm happy to discuss it. I think the timing is right. Mrs. Brill. Thank you, and I look forward to the discussion, and I do know that some of the information will take time to bring back, but that's why I wanna make it, I, th I think it has to be a discussion and a workshop, because we do need to look at that policy, too. There is a piece that, and whether we do that separately, I think we can do it at the same time. The policy is a very important part of the conversation. I personally have no interest in an RFP. Back in the day when we were talking about whether to do it internally or externally, we did it that way. Um, I am the the county IG is totally different than the county IG was back in those days. So what occurred back then for me doesn't really play as much into it. I think we just have to look at, for me it's gonna be cost, whether it's cost effective, um, looking at the cost for the when we've had to outsource, how that's impacted us. And I have no problem with giving Mr. Burke the time to get the, the dollars together, both internally and from the county IG. I'd rather have a comprehensive workshop with everything there. I just feel like we asked for it last year, we asked for it in January and February, and I feel like we need to get it on the calendar, whether it's July, whether it's August. You know, Mr. Chu is gonna be leaving us, and I don't wanna be sitting here when he's ready to leave and we don't have a plan in place. Right. Mrs. Whitfield, sure. Thank Dr. You. Robinson. So, so I think, kind of going back to what I was saying, I think one of the difficulties of this conversation is really that we don't have a staff person to lean on to get this information for us. Obviously the seven of us don't don't garner information from the community and try to um, figure this out. So um, I don't know if Mr. Burke is definitely the most um, appropriate person or if there's also a piece for um, Dr. LaCava to be a part of to really um, understand what our options are that are out there. One of the things my understanding Miami-Dade has done is um, not to lose all of the um, inspector general employees, but some of them were brought on um, to the county IG, so the county IG oversees that. So I'd love to see um, a model that even brings in both um, going completely out, staying completely in, and then um, an understanding of maybe um, a mix or some sort of hybrid so that um, you know we do have some experience and some skilled people within this building. I don't want them all to feel that they're gonna lose 
their jobs. So as another opportunity to maybe even see all three of those. And then I'd really like to, right now, figure out which staff member through the deputy superintendent could be um, given to help us with this because I think this is why it's been lost in all the questions we've had in the past is it's not really been assigned to anybody. Okay, Dr. Robinson. Thank you. I, well, in my mind, we give that to the superintendent and deputy to figure out who answers which question, but, um, but as part of that, the information prior to such board discussion, I would like to see um, the information about different municipalities. I, I don't follow the county IG closely, um, but I do have recollection of people deciding not to go with the county IG or people who were with the county IG and then withdrew or some such thing. I would just like to get the backup information on those details as we walk into that conversation. Thank you. Mrs. Andrews. And I'd like to get information from um, the IG office itself. We have all these employees who've been working here for us all these years, an inspector general, um, a, an attorney. And so we can actually get information from them. I mean, they have actually had evaluations of their department, the pros and the cons of how things work. We need to be getting that stuff. I mean, you can talk to a whole lot of people, but we've had some success right inside here, and we need to ask the people to give us that, those documents, because I think they have them. Mrs. Brill. And just as final, um, the, we will keep our audit staff, obviously, and a lot of those people do have some dual roles. Um, but the, the interesting thing is I think Miami-Dade has changed the way they're doing the, their inspector general since we had those initial conversations. Um, and as I mentioned before, the county IG is not the same county IG. So I appreciate the history that Dr. Robinson is asking for, but I think we need it to be more up to date. It's been a few years since we looked into those entities. So things have changed and evolved quite a bit. Um, and also, you know, the, the way the county IG has been operating has also changed over the years. So um, if you're not able to set a date now, I would just ask publicly that we get a commitment that the superintendent and deputy superintendent work with staff to see when the information would be complete and then just give us the heads up to come back to us um, because time's gonna go by quickly. Thank you. Mr. Oswald. So, we think it's loud and clear that we definitely want to do this sooner than later. So we'll have a conversation with Dr. Fenoy and Mr. Burke and try to schedule that um, to see if we can gather all that information that will be somewhat comprehensive to the liking of the board as well as involving um, the IG department in itself. Ms. Rico. Point of information regarding process. So the workshop slash discussion, you know, is, is totally appropriate for this, as, as you all know. Um, action cannot be taken, but I would just uh, recommend to the board that a clear set of deliverables be identified through the superintendent so those can come back to you in a uh, timely manner so that you have all that in front of you. Um, and the scope of the nature of the workshop be set forth clearly as we um, help gather that information for you all. Right. Mrs. Bass, do you think that, that you got enough of all of this for your list of everything? All right. And Mr. Burke, right. did you want to? Mr. Burke. Uh, no, I think we've covered it. I was just going to offer what, what I'm capable of doing <laughs> versus what uh -huh. may require help. Uh, certainly anything that we've spent, um, I can break down. I can give the history back to, this conversation goes back to 2012, I believe. So it has been several years. We have that history. Uh, your, your Office of Inspector General does have a couple functions. You know, they have the internal audit function, the investigative side, and then they have what they call compliance that really supports both those efforts. So there'll be some breakdown of those costs to assign, you know, we'll probably have to take a pro rata, a pro, a pro rata approach. Uh, and then the uh, school districts are, we're fairly unique to have an IG. I believe it's just us in Miami-Dade to have our own IG. And the situation in Miami-Dade, I've researched recently. Um, I had some prior board questions uh, to reach out to the county. I think Ms. Brill, you asked months ago. And the county IG, our county IG, indicated that he thought the, the uh, structure in Miami-Dade might serve us well, where they have an independent 
county IG supervising actually school board employees that are hired as investigators and stuff. So there's a lot of information I think we can put together for your workshop. Uh, and then I think, you know, the, it'd be a good idea to ask the inspector general also if he wants to complement that information with anything he has and then let the board kind of take the discussion from there. I don't know if we'll be able to get you all the way to exactly what it would cost to go with the county because I think that would require some negotiation and you'd probably have to take this a little further, but we can probably estimate and speculate a little bit based on what we see in Miami-Dade and our conversations with the county. Mrs. Brill. And, and just for full disclosure, I did speak to our IG. I spoke to Mr. Chu. And so he has offered to help provide us with that information. I didn't want to blindside anybody with my discussion item, so he knew what I was bringing up and the points I was raising, and he's offered his assistance. So, you know, we can avail ourselves of his help as well. All right, that concludes yeah. our workshops. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Whitfield. All in favor, all opposed, motion carries. We'll move to our special meeting and call this meeting to order. Let the record show that all six board members are still here. Mr. Barbieri is absent. Um, Mr. Superintendent, we had one item added, P3. Anything else to add? No. And two items that withdrawn, CI1 and LD1. Any other items to withdraw? No. All right. Um, good cause is, in this meeting is included for P3 in order to give the employees impacted by this recommendation to start their jobs as soon as possible. Oh yes, we have to do the pledge. Sorry about that. Please stand for the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. At this point, we have no items pulled from consent. Does anybody want to pull any items from consent? Seeing none, is there a motion to approve the agenda? Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Brill. Any discussion? All in favor, all opposed. Are there any abstentions or disclosures? Seeing none, we'll move into superintendent's report and board member comments. Mr. Oswald. Thank you, Mr. Shaw, and good afternoon, board members, and to the public out there. I know a number of us had the opportunity to be in here a little earlier this afternoon to this, see the swearing in of six more officers to our force. Congratulations to Chief Kitsuro and your hiring. I think that now brings us up to 81, so great job there. Also, I'd like to recognize the more than 250 volunteers who came out Saturday to the Comcast Cares Beautification at Forest Hill Elementary School. Teachers, families, tutors, Comcast employees, and even the school nurse were up very early in the heat to work on landscaping, painting murals throughout the campus, and sprucing up that striping in the parking lot and drop-off loop. As Principal Scott McNichols said, the students will feel uplifted and walk a little taller thanks to your kindness and willingness to get a little dirty, so thank you. Also, last Friday, we celebrated the district's volunteers and business partners who dedicate their time, expertise, service, and business dollars to support Palm Beach County Schools. Our district has more than 44,000 dedicated and selfless volunteers who donate their time to Palm Beach County Schools last year. This is worth an estimated $24 million contributed to the district. We appreciate your continued support of our schools and our students. And speaking of being appreciative, let me say to the more than 12,000 teachers in the classroom and the numerous other educators who are in our offices and schools throughout the district, we appreciate you this week. Let's take a moment to watch a special message from Dr. Fenoy to our teachers. Hello teachers, this week, May 6th through the 10th, is Teacher Appreciation Week. On behalf of all of our students and staff, I want to say thank you. Because of you, we have watched our graduation rate climb to 91.7%. Because of you, we are closing the achievement gap. 
As a son of a former teacher and as a former teacher myself, I appreciate and understand the dedication and tireless efforts in the classroom. You are driven by a passion to help each student realize his or her full potential and to achieve a world-class education. You are a mentor, an inspiration, and a role model for children. Never underestimate the impact of a pat on the back, a kind word, or a friendly smile. The impact you have on our students helps shape their thoughts and the way they view the world and themselves. So I invite you this week to take a moment to reflect on a teacher who played a positive role in your life. Then, realize that the students sitting in your classroom may one day reflect on you with that same admiration. Thank you again for all that you do for our kids. In addition to Teacher Appreciation Week, did you also know it's also Nurse Appreciation Week? It seems fitting to me that teachers and nurses share this Appreciation Week each year. They both are selfless heroes in their profession who educate us and keep us healthy. So in addition to thanking our teachers, I'd like to also thank our school nurses who are there for every tummy ache and playground wound that our teachers may have. Thank you, nurses. Let's have a round of applause for our teachers and our school nurses as we show appreciation this week. And if you can believe it, this year is almost over. Next week, we begin the 32 graduation ceremonies where we will have the opportunity to shake the hands of the students of the class of 2019. Year after year, this is one of the most exciting times in the school year. I encourage everyone to take the time to watch a graduation ceremony or two as they will be streaming live on the district's website and on Camcast channel 235. Regardless of if you work in a school at the district office or a member of our community, it's worth the time to see the excitement on the students' faces and be inspired by their achievements. It is a reminder for all of us to the important work we are doing and a reminder for our community as to why we make the collective investment in public education. Congratulations, class of 2019. And finally, for those students who are not graduating this year, which is not most of you, it's time to talk about preventing that summer slide. The student district has once again put together our summer inspirations websites with learning tools, tips, and suggested re reading material for all of our students. I encourage parents to take a look at the very many resources that are available and take a commitment to spend a little time this summer, even if it's just a couple of hours a week, to spend time uh, using these lessons that are at your fingertips. These, again, resources are available on our website. This concludes my comments for this evening. Thank you. Board member comments, Ms. McQuinn. Short, I promise. I'm sure that when we get through all of the graduations and successfully close out the school year, we will be reminded of all of the groups who um, help those kids get across the stage. So I'll save that for now. I would like to um, recognize specifically again the ongoing support with grant funds from the Mary and Robert Pugh Fund. It's millions of dollars more since I sat here almost three years ago and talked about the total money that they put in our high poverty schools. And um, I, in particular, Louise Grant, who administers that money. Yeah, I saw her sitting there. <laughs> she doesn't want us to look at her. Um, <laughs> what she does is quite special in that she, she wants the school, insists that the school, or in terms of district, it may be leadership at the district level, but that we're growing capacity. It isn't just throwing some money at us and saying, well, okay, you get it, you do what you say you're going to do, and you do it. It is growing capacity, and I've seen that myself happen, um, talking about the conservatory school and so many others, so I'm not going to get into all of those, but there is one on the on the agenda tonight that we passed. And um, But the other important thing that Ms. Grant does is she personally follows up with the schools and that's not often the case so it's a ton of money that we appreciate and we appreciate the individual follow-up thank you mrs. Whitfield 
Thank you. Um, I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about two things really quickly. Um, the first is um, a couple last week, week before last month ago, something like that, I don't know, it all runs together. Um, we had um, Julia Mate from um, our curriculum department come and ask us if we wanted to go see a stem spiration school. Um, I know Dr. Robinson is, is scheduling right now to also go, but I wanted to recommend to my colleagues to go and see this um, in action. This is also funded through Pew, so thank you so much, Ms. Grant. Um, I, the thing that I was so excited about it is with all this conversation surrounding project-based learning, um, this is a way that um, they have figured out to expand this to so many schools. So I was at Grassy Waters today, um, which fabulous school, oh my goodness. When you see the teachers and how inspired they are, it really um, brings home Teacher Appreciation Week. Um, they were amazing. They hosted me for two hours this morning. I think I drove them nuts. I asked so many questions. I wanted to see every single classroom that was doing all this work. Um, um, and I got to see um, the discovery education um, uh, people were there actually. I just happened to show up on a day that they were actually um, training the teachers. Um, so it was a really fabulous way um, to learn about how they're expanding project-based learning. They are in a few of our schools. Um, so I just wanted to encourage my colleagues to go and see that. The second thing is that at our last board meeting, um, I'm not trying to reopen this discussion by any means, but I wanted to clarify um, some comments of mine that were possibly taken out of context so that um, I could be exceptionally clear about it. Um, when we were talking about the expulsions at the last meeting, um, one of the things that I had mentioned was that we needed to look into um, what the state did allow and just to be really clear, I'm not saying to not pay attention to what the state is saying, but to make sure that we are following the rules of the state, um, because I believe safety is the most important thing, and I uh, really want to be clear that I'm not trying to go around uh, laws set by the state. So um, just so that we are exceptionally clear through that, those were the intentions of my comments. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Brill. Thank you. So I thought I would do something a little different today in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week. I decided to research the origin of giving an apple to the teacher. Alas, it was not such an easy task. There apparently is no clear answer. I found some interesting comments from teachers themselves. One said, since families had been bringing food to teachers since before there was public education, apples were among the items brought. They are relatively inexpensive and they keep pretty well. Another said it was portrayed in the Hour Gang short films made in the 1930s and 40s, but certainly it doesn't happen anymore. Families do sometimes give gifts to teachers at the holidays, but a single apple would be seen as a bit odd. And many of these days, per, many of these days prefer to select their own fruit and wash it well before eating. Finally, yet another said, it would be a relic from paying frontier teachers in the form of food. It could be based on the Adam and Eve story in the Bible. Most likely it was influenced by the Bing Crosby song, Apple for the Teacher. Having read all sorts of explanations, including a rather lengthy one from smithsonian.com, I'll go with this. The tradition of giving an apple to, the teach, to a teacher started in the 1700s before governments around the world paid for education of its people. Poor families in Denmark and Sweden gave teachers baskets of apples and potatoes as payment for teaching their children. So teachers, although we pay you with slightly more than apples and potatoes, I want to express my attitude. Your devotion to your students and passion for your profession is evident in all that you do. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mrs. Andrews. Thank you and good afternoon to everyone. And tonight I heard a few of you talk about the conservatory school. Well, I had an opportunity to visit the school and to see the project-based learning uh, in play. Fabulous, impressive to see how different children learn and the independence. I'm happy to hear that the school district is going to do something. I don't know what yet but you're committed to doing something, school board as well as the administration. I would like to see this in every school in Palm Beach County. It's awesome. 
and the Palm Beach County Council of Math teachers, you do it every year. You celebrate your own. You selected the math teacher of the year from the elementary, the middle, and the high school at the Palm Beach County Marriott. It's always exciting. I was happy to be the board member to shake the hands of all of the finalists and those that won. Making math exciting and fun in all of our classes is just a great thing. And lastly, I want to thank our community leaders. Uh, over the weekend, I had an opportunity to be uh, at Jess Santa Maria, former county commissioner Jess Santa Maria's, my brother's and sister's keeper. And this is a program where they give scholarships to our schools in the Western communities. They give $500 to $1,000 scholarships to our students. The principals, you're out there every year. The students write an essay on why it's good to have a good heart and good citizenship and how doing the right thing makes a difference. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, community leaders, in making it happen. And lastly, CAFSA, the Caribbean American Organization in Palm Beach County, giving scholarships to our students again. I saw so many students from Boca Raton, Jupiter, the Glades, receive those scholarships. So as we move into graduation, we're looking at outstanding teachers, we're looking at outstanding students, and we celebrate our teachers with teacher appreciation. So we know that we're doing the right thing because we see so many accolades, so many celebrations of good work. Thank you. Dr. Robinson. Thank you. Um, so I don't, I don't normally make board comments at these workshops, but I have two things I want to say. The first is to circle back to the previous workshop because she triggered my memory here. Um, so I would hope that we would see um, one of those fine bullets um, talk about the expansion of the project-based learning, uh, and spe specifically with professional development, right? So having said that, the, uh, my other comment is um, actually because it is Teacher Appreciation Week. So I want to tell you about Mrs. Hoffine. Um, and Mrs. Hoffine was my fourth and fifth grade teacher, so we um, circled or cycled. What is that term? So she was, I had her for fourth grade and she followed us to fifth, right? And so, and Mrs. Hoffine was old, right? So she had those, um, those stockings that she knotted at the knees. You remember those? And those beige shoes. I mean, I, and I just thought she was like old as dirt, right? And so, but she was so good. So she taught us, she taught us to play chess. She had us doing those SRA packages as a reward. As a reward now, like I'm, I'm trying to figure that out retrospectively. So she also put me in this program that I now realize was a um, gifted program where we went to the um, community college like three days a week or something like that. But anyway, so she pushed us. So this is the part I want to tell you about Mrs. Hoffine. So every time I graduated from high school, college, and med school, she sent a card to my daddy's office. And I was like, She's still living. I mean, I really thought she was old, right? And, um, and every time my daddy would say, a good teacher determines whether or not they're good based on their students. Okay, daddy, right? And so then when I was a resident and I was doing an infectious disease rotation, I got this call to do a consult on a post-operative fever on this guy named Hoffine, right? So it's not clicking in my head, you know, I'm like doing 36 hour shifts and stuff. And I go in there and I see this guy, this old guy, right? And so I'm trying to take his past medical history. And he said, well, it's three o'clock. If you wait like another half hour, my wife will be here. School will be out. What? I, I, what? Are you Mr. Hoffine? that was the crossing guard that used to dress up for Halloween and Christmas and stuff. I mean, seriously, I like almost melted there, right? Cause this was like, uh, seriously. And then Mrs. Hoffine walked in the room and I, I was just boohoo cried, right? And so Mrs. Hoffine looked at me and said, Debbie, Debbie Robinson, is that you? And I, I, it was over, right? I'm telling you, I was done. I'm like, the nurses are looking at me like I've lost my mind. And so, and Mrs. Hoffine stood there in that room and named everybody in our fourth and fifth grade class. Mm -hmm. Everyone, I don't remember half these people, right? And she was saying, you remember, he said, 
to the road, in the road to your right, two seats behind you. She named every student, and every student in my fourth grade class, now this is in Flint, Michigan, okay? Flint, Michigan, at Walker Elementary School, where I don't know, I think we probably had a high free and reduced lunch rate, and I think we had a low rate of high school and college education in the, in the parent population, right? Each and every one of my classmates went to college, and all but one finished in four years or less. Yeah. And Ms. Hoffine told me this, right? Mm -hmm. And she was just completely shocked that I didn't remember all these people and keep track of them, right? But, so in honor of Teacher Appreciation Week, I want to just say how much I thank Mrs. Hoffine and all those like her, because I mean, in truth, if it wasn't for Mrs. Hoffine, I, you know, I don't know where I would be today. How about that? That's good. So thank you, Mrs. Hoffine. <laughs> One of the items on the consent agenda today was P1, and I was gonna pull it, but since um, I have an opportunity, I was absolutely thrilled today to see the promotions of some of our police officers uh, because the quality of the people who are working in our school police department is unmatched any place in this state. And I just wish we could give the information to the public the way I wish that it was possible to do for the public to realize just what goes on every day in our schools with our police officers and to see the kind of people that were promoted today, I think is just an absolute, um, just a, a, a wonderful thing for us to be able to do. And the second thank you I need to give today is to, um, is to Claudia Shea and Carol Bass. I th uh, hopefully the board saw the, uh, the high tech uh, thank you to teachers that was posted yesterday, but we worked, I think we did it on Monday and on Tuesday it was out to everybody on behalf of the board to say thank you to all of our teachers. And Claudia said, next year just wait because they've got something even bigger planned on, on all of the high tech that can be done in that. But to everybody, thank you so much. With that, we'll move to our uh, court committee report. Mr. Doctor. Good afternoon, uh, Vice Chairman Shaw and board members, Deputy Superintendent Oswald. That's a change for me. <laughs> My name's Lou Doctor. I'm here representing your Construction Oversight Committee. We had a meeting on May 8th, and there were six items on your agenda today. That's important that you review and you approve in order to hold the construction schedules that we have ahead of us. So uh, we had. Uh, 13 authorized positions in Cork and 10 members were at the meeting. Under construction purchasing PC1, it's construction manager at risk for Verde Elementary School. Uh, the motion was to go forward on that by a vote to six to four. Although let me tell you that the four votes were in favor of it going forward, but they wanted to highlight what they felt was an improvement that could be made in the data that was presented to them and that was the reason why they voted no. Uh, basically, they felt the superintendent's cost for the project should be specified for the project, and they felt it was too high. If you read the backup material that we're all provided, they're using the same su superintendent for the entire Verde job, which means ripping out the school, uh, putting in the uh, modules, transferring the kids, ripping down the school, building a new school, transferring the kids back, and they wanted one superintendent to coordinate that entire effort because it's extremely schedule driven and they wanted someone who was familiar with it. So the compromise was go forward, but the staff will come back and give us a breakout of which of his costs are directly related to demolition and which, which is the, pro the purpose of this uh, project and which are related to the support activities for the entire project. So I don't believe the costs are gonna change, but it will satisfy that request. And uh, that was the reason for the negative vote. So I would obviously urge you to go forward with it. Construction uh, PC2, construction at risk for Calaloosa Elementary School. 
That was recommended by forward by a vote of uh, 10 to zero. If we took a vote, that means it was not on consent and there was a discussion by the court members. The issue on this one was they wanted more clarification on details on how the funding for the job was determined. There was a base amount listed, and as the job proceeds, they will submit a guaranteed max price, which obviously they'll be held to, and that's a standard way to do business. Uh, they wanted more backup for the rough cost that was estimated in the proposal. Obviously, the construction manager had that information and would provide it. When items like that happen, and Cork recommends they go forward, but we have questions, your staff records those questions, and once a month, we get an update of the question we've asked and the answers and replies, and I have to compliment your staff. They're very thorough in terms of documenting the open questions, giving us the answers, and following up, and that's been working very, very well. That's why you never hear about it, what I have to say. The third item is PC3, Loxahatchee Groves. Uh, it was recommended they go forward. One of the cork members had a technical question about the process that was gonna be used to clean the material and felt that uh, acid cleaning of brick was inappropriate. The construction manager who was in the room said, we don't acid clean brick, we pressure clean brick and we understand the possibilities for deterioration and so that issue disappeared but that's why it wasn't on the consent agenda. PC4 Citrus Cove Elementary that was also recommended by a vote of 10 to zero. One of the cork members felt there should be a beneficial ownership document in the package. That was who the owners of the company are. It turns out it was within the 672 pages that we received, he apparently overlooked it. So therefore, we proceeded and we went forward. PC5 was construction and risk for Connison uh, Middle School. It was moved forward by a vote to 10 to zero. The question that was raised was that there are flat roofs on the school and how are the flat roofs gonna be repaired and maintained? Uh, the construction people in the room said, the biggest problem with leaking on flat roofs is not the roof, it's where the roof abuts some other material. In this case, for example, the roof abuts a stucco wall. And when they went up on the roof and inspected the stucco wall, they realized they had to rip out and replace the wall because it was full of cracks and the moisture was leaking through the stucco wall into the building not through the roof itself. They're also changing the roofing material, getting rid of asphalt, which causes errors and smells using a new silicone material that's been time tested, has much longer guaranteed life, and it's easier to apply. So it was a very interesting technical conversation that came out of the, the objection to uh, the issue. And PC5, Coniston Elementary School, the question was on whether it's a flat roof or a pitched roof because they get handled differently, and that issue went away. Final one was PC6, Okahili Middle School. There was an issue raised that if they're renovating the plumbing, there should be shut off valves that can isolate the bathrooms, not having to turn off the water for the entire school when they have to do a plumbing repair. Obviously, that wasn't in the specifications of the documentation. The contract is that if they are renovating bathrooms and it's not there, they do put it in. They wouldn't do it as a change for uh, any other reason, but if they're working on the restrooms in the facility, and a lot of them are, they would make sure the water shutoff valve was installed as part of the job. So uh, the point I'm making is, Corp does a conscientious job and raises a lot of questions that could drive you crazy, but I think that's what you expect them to do. Uh, are there any questions? Mrs. Wayfield. Thank you, I just wanted to say, first of all, you guys are so good. I mean, unbelievable. The, your work um, must have gone up so much since we've gotten so much money to pay. I'm sure you guys are spending most of your life um, working on reading these documents, but I wanna say thank you so much. And also on your item where you were discussing Verdi and the split up of the superintendent, I was wondering just to ask staff if we could also see that um, in maybe an email or something when, when Cork receives that breakdown. Um, I think that would be beneficial to us as well. I would love to see that, thank you. 
I, I do you. have to say, your staff is exceptional uh, in the preparation of the material and the explanations, and I thought it would be a short meeting. There were six items that should have been approved. We had to extend it for an extra hour to cover all the conversations. <laughs> Mr. Doctor, how long does it take you to read all those documents you get for every meeting? Well, I've, I find out one thing. Five of the, five of the contracts are identical. Okay. So while they're different projects, they're identical. The key is how the contractors respond and how they go about bidding it. Okay. But I'll let you know that secret. All right. Thank <laughs> you. Thank you very much. Thank so you. So th that's all the committee reports. We had no speakers today. So is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Mrs. McQuinn. Any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion carries 6-0. New business. We have one item, P3. Mr. Superintendent. I recommend the board approve the personnel addendum as submitted. Motion by Mrs. Andrews, second by Mrs. Brill. Any discussion? Dr. Robinson. Thank you. So I am thrilled, assuming this is approved, that we will finally have a CAO, well, again, right? And, um, I, but I have a question about, about the positioning. So the, I just want to be clear because the job description says the CAO assists and supports the deputy soup. The, the organizational chart as it exists does not include a CAO, at least I can't find it. And so I guess it's a two, twofold. One, to confirm that the CAO will report to the deputy. And then two, um, to ask legal, how often is the org chart supposed to be updated for the board's approval? Ms. Rico. Thank you. It's supposed to be updated annually, and that usually takes place during the budget um, approval process. So as the org chart lives and breathes and gets modified through these types of changes, it, it happens in real life, and then you get the approval of the overall org chart the, for the annual statutory compliance. So that's how it works. Right. Dr. Robinson. And so I would like to get the confirmation that the, since the org chart doesn't reflect it, that the CAO is reporting to the deputy will or, or correct me in the microphone. Yes, that is correct. And we'll bring that updated. It, okay. it will also be a cabinet level position. And if I may, Mr. Shaw, so congratulations to Dr. Sheffield. We will. And uh, we will be introducing her when Dr. Fenoy is here in June, as well as the new principles that are on the agenda, agenda as well. All right, any other discussion? Seeing none, call the question. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion carries 6-0. That concludes our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn? Motion by Mrs. Whitfield, second by Dr. Robinson. All in favor? All opposed? We are adjourned. <laughs>